Hey, this is The Last Coffee House, the top 100 books of all time, the best literature, fair tales, and stories by Hans Christian Andersen, better known as HCA the Rebel, his rap name. He's Danish. They call him H.C. Andersen in Danish. They don't like the Hans Christian part for some reason. <laughs> they just say H.C. Andersen. Like D.W. Griffith. Dante Willington Griffith. Now, in the midst of my reading, I stumbled upon a factoid that said that there were 3,381 works by H.C. Anderson. <laughs> that seems like a lot, so I'm not sure if that's correct. Some background, he actually got a travel grant from the king so that he could travel around and be inspired. <laughs> it's like, we need to go back to monarchy. The first two installments of fairy tales were published around 1835. Hans Christian Andersen died in 1875, so this collection, I think, was put together after that. One of his major inspirations was the Arabian Nights that was read to him as a child by his father, who ultimately passed away. Not like ultimately, like when he was 85 in Florida or whatever. I mean, he died when Hans Christian Andersen was younger, and then I'm sure that had some kind of a psychological impact on him for the rest of his life. He had actually a lot of unrequited... <laughs> love interests of men and women <laughs> although he was seemingly asexual apparently but one of the girls he was in love with was named ryborg voigt <laughs> ryborg that might be a common name in denmark so it could be incredibly insensitive for me to find that name absolutely hilarious but can you imagine introducing her at parties like in the united states like this is this is my wife ryborg <laughs> it's our daughter chisel it's ridiculous. Uh, sorry, that's so insensitive. Okay, so the contents of the stories. Most everybody's probably heard of a, some of these stories, at least heard the name, and heard of some of these stories even if they don't know them in their original forms. It's impossible to cover the breadth of the stories. It was a long book. There were a lot of pieces here. And yet again, getting the Decameron flashbacks. A lot of the stories were actually just revisions of stories that he heard as a child. The town that he lived in only had like 8,000 people, and this was a regular cultural practice there, which was just to tell stories to each other. And one of the things, you know, that came across in the stories that were appropriated for things in the United States is that a lot of the stories, they weren't just meant to be entertainment, but they were meant to teach morals. Obviously, this isn't a new development when it comes to storytelling in general. I mean, we've got the Bible. <laughs> but still, when it comes to the way that they were used in the future, or have been used by Disney and, and other people, you've got this idea and this structure about a moral teaching that's built on top of a plot. So some ones that everybody's heard of, The Little Mermaid, The Emperor's New Clothes, The Princess and the Pea, Although I hadn't heard of that one. I've, I mean, I've heard the name, but I didn't even know what the story was. The Ugly Duckling and Thumbelina. Obviously, people know those ones. The Little Mermaid, a big deal. The Emperor's New Clothes. Wasn't that made into a modified version of a Disney movie? Was that a Disney movie? That was a Disney movie. I've, I've seen every Disney movie. I should know this. But so, anybody who doesn't know The Princess and the Pea, if you don't know this story, I don't know why I just didn't know this story. I'm sure everybody had heard it before, but when I read it, I was laughing out loud. I was literally laughing out loud. You've got the mother who's trying to find a princess for her son, who's a prince or whatever, and she wants to make sure she finds a princess. She just wants just some, some random girl who doesn't have the accolades. So the way she tries to figure this out is to say that... A princess is such a diva that if you put a pea under a stack of mattresses, that the princess is still going to feel like there's a lump in it. So she... <laughs> There's this girl who was like out in the weather or something and she needs a place to sleep. And so the mother stacks up all these mattresses, puts a little pee under there. And the girl wakes up the next morning and is like, and she's like, oh, how'd you sleep? And she's like, oh my God, there was such a horrible bump. And I couldn't sleep at all, all night. So it's like, all right, we've got a match made in heaven. It was, it, I don't know why, but it just made me laugh out loud. I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Then The Little Mermaid, obviously, uh, one of the great Disney films, which actually came long after Disney had left, which surprised me, but I don't know why it surprised me. I don't know why I have no concept of time when it comes to that sort of thing. So The Little Mermaid, obviously, you know the story of Ariel and Sebastian and <laughs> all the lovely songs and all that stuff. In this one, it's got a lot of those same elements. It's about the longing infidelity of love. The mermaid falls in love with a human prince and wants to be a part of that world, but it doesn't work out. <laughs> in, obviously, the Disney version, it works out. Everybody's happy and, and lovely, and it's great. It doesn't work out in this particular story. <laughs> it could have gone better. But it's timeless. Everybody can relate to this story. I mean, the number of times I've had to turn down a mermaid, just insane. So, 
Yeah, I can see it. And my favorite one, actually, was the Steadfast Tin Soldier. This one, like, hit me on a gut level. And if anybody doesn't know this story, I'm going to tell it. I'm going to spoil it for you. And I actually watched, uh, there was a animated version that was done by Ub Iwerks. Ub Iwerks was one of the early animators at Disney, but he left and had a huge problem with Disney thereafter. And the animated version of the Steadfast Tin Soldier, he called it the Brave Soldier or something like that. It was horrendous. It was terrible. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I mean, some of the animation look nice but the changes to the story were terrible the song was just direct exposition of whatever was going on and i hated it i didn't even finish it i just watched like the first couple of minutes and i was done and yes the guy's name is ub iwerks i i have no i mean it sounded like an early apple precursor you know like something that apple built <laughs> they built an animator and iwerks but no that's the real that's the guy's actual name Anyway, the Steadfast Tin Soldier. So, the story of this is there's a soldier who has one leg. And it's not like a war injury or something like that. It was that there wasn't enough metal when they were trying to make the soldiers. They made like 25 of them. And he was the last one. They just didn't have enough metal for his, his other leg. So, they're like standing there where the kid placed them, you know, playing with the, the soldiers. And the soldier with one leg sees a ballerina. And the way that she's situated, her other leg is hid behind her. She's just, you know, twirling on one leg. So, it looks like she only has one leg too so he's like instantly in love and can't stop looking at her but there's an evil jack-in-the-box that i love this villain an evil jack-in-the-box who tells him to stop looking at her because the jack-in-the-box wants her i don't know how any of this reproduction works when it comes to these kind of toys but so the evil jack-in-the-box isn't happy and in the story itself it's actually ambiguous about the next part the steadfast tin soldier falls out of a window and the story itself says you don't know whether it's wind or it was the evil jack-in-the-box <laughs> so i love that i love just writing in ambiguity to your own story like that but the sol soldier did ignore the evil jack-in-the-box or pretended not to hear him when the jack-in-the-box said you know stop looking at her so he falls out the window, he ends up get being eaten by a fish, he miraculously returns to the house, and is put on the table where he started, only to be tossed in the fire by the boy, and the ballerina, by the, the wind, blows her into the fire, and then he forms into, like, this uh, melted metal heart thing, <laughs> so... But it was the first story that Hans Christian Andersen wrote that actually didn't have a literary model or a folktale precursor. So it was like his own original story. And I, I think it's wonderful. It's brilliant. I love it. Can't really make a full featured movie out of it, but it's still, I loved it. Anyway, so here's some criticism. Kierkegaard was an early reader of Hans Christian Andersen and had some commentary on it. Let's see what Kierkegaard has to say. The whole leap of faith thing came out of Kierkegaard. Okay, let's see what he has to say. In Andersen as a novelist, Kierkegaard remarks that Andersen is characterized as a possibility of a personality, wrapped up in such a web of arbitrary moods and moving through an elegiac duodecimal scale, i.e. a chromatic scale, proceeding by semitones, and therefore including sharps as well as flats. Such a scale is associated more with lament, or elegy than is an ordinary diatonic scale of almost echoless dying tones just as easily roused as subdued who in order to become a personality needs a strong life development end quote so that's what kierkegaard had to say about hans christian anderson it's funny i used these exact criticisms when i criticized avengers endgame so it's uh it's weird how great minds uh i'm not sure how generally great <laughs> Great minds think alike on that. So there, there's what Kierkegaard thought about Hans Christian Andersen. Here's what somebody else thought about it. Contemporary readers might find it hard to imagine just how different Anderson's tales were from those before him. They were beautifully paced and passionate, at times sorrowful and full of pathos, and at other times wickedly funny. Simply put, they were a pleasure to read, and they spoke directly to children's sensibilities rather than condescending to them. End quote. The second reviewer had a lot of very instructive things to say about it. It really speaks to the ch children's sensibilities without being condescending to them, and that's one of the things that I think I found the most. That's one of the things that a lot of early Disney movies were able to do. Not be condescending to children, but still be able to appeal to those sensibilities so that adults who are watching it got to feel like children again, and children who are watching it got a taste of adulthood. So that's why they're so broadly appealing, and that's why I think these stories are still so broadly appealing. Now, there's a kind of tonal thing when it comes to Hans Christian Andersen's stories, 
where you've got really dark turns in most of these. Uh, you've got this weird, broad, positive, one with the world kind of ending to a lot of these stories, but where something bad happens, but it still turn it turns out like it's it's really okay because they've moved on to something else. And he's a Christian. There's a, there's a lot of um, biblical context to a lot of this stuff. Still, so you've got some dark turns in a lot of these things. So anyway, let's uh, go on to some quotes. I've just got a couple of quotes. Quote, being born in a duckyard does not matter if only you are hatched from a swan's egg, end quote. So that's a little chunk just so you can understand. It's a kind of moral. I have no idea why I took that one <laughs> specifically. <laughs> Uh, but you've got the moralizing that's going to, going to come on the end of it. And structurally, there's something refreshing about that structure where it's just, it's put together and you get to read it. It's easy to read. There's nice pacing. It's going along. And you get to come to a moral where it just makes a clean sense through the whole thing. So there's something about it. Another quote. <laughs> Quote, when the evening came, the other ten soldiers were put away in their box, and the people of the house went to bed. Now the toys began to play among themselves at visits and battles and at giving balls. The ten soldiers rattled about in their box, for they wanted to play too, but they could not get the lid open. The nutcracker turned somersaults, and the slate pencils squeaked out jokes on the slate. Toys made such a noise that they woke up the canary bird, who made them a speech all in verse. The only two who stayed still were the tin soldier and the little dancer. Without ever swerving from the tip of one toe, she held out her arms to him, and the tin soldier was just as steadfast on his one leg. Not once did he take his eyes off her, end quote. So you can see there's a, a literary flair. There's not all that much experimentation or anything like that when it comes to the prose, but there's there's a flair to it. I mean, most of the writing and the storytelling is just clean and straightforward and trying to get the story across as opposed to trying to really push the medium when it comes to the words themselves. But it's got its own really unique kind of ideas about what a story should be, about how they should flow, and, and what the characters do or don't do and all that. So... A little analysis, shortly before his death, Anderson had consulted a composer about the music for his funeral, saying, Most of the people who will walk after me will be children, so make the beat keep time with little steps, end quote. What a sentiment to be really cognizant of the people who are going to be dancing at your funeral or walking up to your coffin at your funeral and wanting the music to make sure that they can, it can keep in time with little steps or something about that phrasing. So by the time of his death, obviously a lot of these great authors will still be obscure and penniless by the end of their lives and not realize the heights to which they will reach. But at the end of Hans Christian Andersen's life, he was internationally revered. He received a national treasure stipend from the Danish government. So that's pretty amazing. And just to talk about kind of the big picture of how this fits in, there is this kind of magical simplicity and something that is great to return to. I'd love to see kind of a refinement return to this simple moral storytelling you know it's something that we kind of have eschewed and i've been i mean i've been a proponent of more complexity when it comes to storytelling and writing in general but it would be nice to see more of this kind of stuff i'm sure there are some great children's books that are able to do this sort of a thing but i wonder how much pandering they do to children and children's sensibilities and how condescending they are as opposed to what this was able to do in its time and still does today so that's the bigger picture that was hans christian anderson fairy tales and stories the complete collection of them i'm sorry i didn't go through more of the stories uh it's just it would take so long <laughs> to do that sort of a thing. I read every single one of them, but I don't want to put up a three-hour episode where we're just going through different stories and all that. So hopefully this gives you an idea of what it's about. Uh, there's the one story, hopefully you remember that, The Steadfast Tin Soldier, if nothing else. And I will see you on the next one. All right, wait. Uh, oh, geez, uh, what's the next one coming up? What is the next one? Hold on, sorry. Next one is Tom Jones by Henry Fielding. So I don't remember much. I already read it. I don't remember anything from it uh but we'll talk about that one uh, to everybody's exaltation on the next <laughs> on the next time we talk about these books uh they're gonna be a bunch of non-fiction in between but anyway hope all is well i'll see you on the next one okay bye